Well, thank you all for being here. I have the distinct uh, honor of being the last speaker <laughs> and the last panel at the last end of the last 10 minutes of the day. So thank you all for sticking around. Um, I have been with the Oregon Environmental Council for almost a year working on sustainable economic development policy. And a lot of what I work on right now is related to biofuels, low carbon fuels, low carbon transportation. Um, and a couple of other things. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about public policy here in Oregon, kind of bringing some of these uh, things that we've talked about down to kind of the, the local and regional scale. Um, I kind of wanted to change, uh, you know, sort of after you all were going through your presentations, wanted to change the tone of mine to talk from kind of a policy wonky discussion to a, more of a motivational speaker approach, um, which is, is I hope to, to encourage every one of you to work on transportation, uh, global warming, and uh, energy policy and make your careers out of that because it's, it's desperately needed. Uh, you know, particularly as David's describing what, uh, what we're, you know, what we're finding about uh, climate change and the way that our energy and transportation uh, contributes so significantly to that. I kind of wanted to just drop this particular boring PowerPoint presentation and focus instead on that. Um, it, it, and the, the thing that we pointed out that really, um, made me want to do that was this distinction between what I would call rational behavior and politics, uh, that a lot of our decisions around transportation and, er and energy use aren't necessarily based on kind of the, the cool, groovy ideas that we're talking about with things like vehicle-to-grid technology. It's very politically driven, and we have a long history of developing regulations, um, tax, po you know, tax policy and tax law, as Roberta pointed out, that really favor um, unsustainable energy pathways. And we've really latched onto them. And the, the statistic that was given about China wanting to put 100 million cars on the road, I don't know what that, that actually looks like. Um, but that's actually kind of scary. China is actually, is actually to some extent ahead of us in terms of the fuel economy of the vehicles that they are putting on the road. I mean, their average sort of national fleet uh, miles per gallon is actually higher than the U.S. Uh, the graph that, uh, that David put up, which showed how uh, light duty and heavy duty fuel economy at some point had this, you know, this, this, this fairly significant rise and then kind of flattened. Um, I think is is kind of a shame um, because it kind of says it, it, that we don't have that we haven't really put our energy our, our, our energy um, you know as a as a society into developing uh, you know in, in improvements in technology that cause that curve to continue to go up. I think there's there are pretty distinct reasons why that curve caps out, and it's not because we lack technical technological innovation. Uh, the example recently that everybody's kind of trotting out when we talk about these issues at a, at a national level is putting a man on the moon in the Apollo mission. I mean, if you set your mind to something, you can do it. So I think that graph is really kind of a shame. So that's kind of why I wanted to just sort of drop the PowerPoint and talk about that, because I think it's really important to look at how, en how, how energy, and particularly tra in, in this panel, transportation policies um, have really shaped the pathway that we've chosen in this country, which is, which is unsustainable. So I do want to uh, maybe pick out a couple of, a couple of issues. Um, we can talk about Oregon Environmental Council. We have several different programs that we work on as an organization. We focus largely on public policy. We do have a lot of programs where we do outreach on different environmental issues, but uh, a good bulk of the work that we do is focused on public policy. So we author um, and seek sponsors for bills related to child's health, uh, removing toxics from children's products, uh, that type of thing. Global warming legislation, you heard a lot during the last panel about things that are going on in Oregon related to global warming and transportation policy, particularly in this next legislative session, and we're very actively engaged on all of that. Um, and then in our sustainable economy program, I mentioned that, that we work on transportation biofuels uh, and removing carbon out of the transportation system. There are, I think, of, um, of, 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 of transportation in three fairly distinct categories that we, focus, that we focused on uh, in public policy in our 
you know, in, in our history of working on transportation, one of the energy inputs into transportation, where does the, where does the energy actually come from in our fuels uh, that we power our, our vehicles with, which I think is as the second category, which is the technology that you put the energy into. And then the third, uh, ca the third facet of transportation is, are, are the guideways that those technologies use, whether it's road, rail, or, um, or air, or, or other pathways that we use for transportation. So public policy has been really focused on those individual categories rather than kind of an integrated approach that threads all of them together. So I want to talk a little bit uh, in the, you know, 45 seconds of <laughs> that I have left about um, really each of, each, each of those and what Oregon is, is doing in each of those. The first one that I mentioned are the energy inputs, um, which focus, have focused largely on fuels. You know, as Roberta pointed out, we've done, um, I would say, comparatively little with modes like bicycle transportation, where your energy input is the super burrito from the, you know, the taqueria truck down the street, um, or it's biofuels, uh, or it's petroleum fuels, or jet fuels. And in the case of, of what David was talking about, you have electricity as your, as your energy input for electric vehicles, uh, plug-in hybrids, which can use both electricity and liquid fuels. And that's kind of the, the secondary fuel, and your primary fuel is really the area of most concern with electric vehicles, um, as David pointed out. Do you want it coming from renewables, coal? Um, and, you know, California has been talking about hydrogen for a long time, particularly Governor Schwarzenegger getting on the, you know, the hyd hydrogen highways uh, bandwagon without paying a, what I would call a whole lot of attention to what is the source of hydrogen. Hydrogen is just an energy carrier. So mostly what we focused on here in Oregon at the Oregon Environmental Council are, are biofuels, and we worked to pass a renewable fuel standard last year in the 2007 session, um, Oregon's legislative cycle obviously being every, every two years. And so there, there are some things that we can do in the interim, but big things like this happen in the, in the standard sessions. And there's a, with the, the 2009 session coming up, there's a pretty huge move to roll back this renewable fuel standard, as you've, you've, you might have read about, particularly related to ethanol and the concern there being is that ethanol is not delivering as promised and it's causing all kinds of problems, so therefore we need, need to get rid of it. I, I, would, I would beg to differ uh, with that position, but anyway, I'm not going to have time to go into sort of the details of the renewable fuel standard, but if any of you are interested in renewable fuels, particularly ethanol, um, or, or even biodiesel, whether it's from the industry side or, you know, legally, how does this play out here in Oregon? I'm happy to talk to you about that afterwards or, or, or um, maybe over email or phone. Um, I think we talked a little bit about the, the federal renewable fuel standard. And one thing that we could do here in Oregon is try to kind of pair up the, the, the laws here with what we're doing federally. We, they're, they're different approaches. They do kind of work together. Um, but the thing that the federal renewable fuel standard does is it actually requires a ramp down of uh, what I would call first generation fuels, which is primarily corn-based ethanol, and a ramp up of cellulosic ethanol and other types of advanced fuels. The reason why I said I wouldn't roll back the, the ethanol standard, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not here to you know, make any kind of case for corn ethanol, but the, the, we don't actually get to cellulosic ethanol without the platform that we're, you know, that we're, that we're, bu we're building on a platform of corn ethanol um, to, to sort of put a front end on the, uh, the, our current production processes. If all of a sudden you say, we don't want corn ethanol, we're going to pull our incentives, and we really could care less what happens to that industry, then you take out the players who are driving uh, the development of cellulosic ethanol. So we actually do have several things in the tax code as part of the Oregon Renewable Fuel Standard that incentivize cellulosic ethanol um, and other feedstocks for, bio, for the production of biodiesel like oil seed crops. Um, canola being a big one here in, in Oregon and Camelina could become another good oil, oil seed crop. So there are actually production incentives in the tax code for um, agricultural producers. So I mentioned financial incentives for biofuels and for feedstock and fuel producers. Um, 
looking at broader fuel policies, one of the, the things that we want to move towards at OEC is what we call a low carbon fuel standard, which has been adopted in California, British Columbia, Washington is considering it, and Oregon will probably consider it in this next legislative session, and there are other states that are, that are looking into this as well. The idea is to reduce carbon in your transportation fuels, just uh, generally in your liquid transportation fuels, by 10 percent by 2020. And the reason why I think that's, that's, it can go hand in hand, it doesn't mean it takes the place of a renewable fuel standard, but I think the reason why it's a good complementary policy is it gets to what Roberta mentioned earlier, which is, is that biofuel, the biofuels policies tend to pick winners. It says biodiesel, corn ethanol, and ideally cellulosic ethanol at some undetermined point in the future, but you're, you're really focusing on, on specific fuel types. What this policy does is it agnostically says in all of your transportation fuels, you have to reduce carbon by 10 percent by 2020. Um, the reason that's significant here in Oregon is that 40, nearly 40 percent of our carbon dioxide emissions, global warming emissions, um, come from the transportation sector. And so the idea here is how do you actually attack that portion of it? You've heard a lot earlier in the day about renewable electricity and how do you, uh, how do you start to reduce carbon in the electricity sector. And unless you have something like this or you include and or you include um, your transportation fuels in a carbon cap and trade policy, or some other kind of, a, of an overarching economy-wide carbon policy, then you don't really have a good way of attacking uh, your, emis your, your emissions in the transportation sector. So this is one of the things that we're working on during this next legislative session. Um, must focus. Yeah, so the, a lot of the focus to date has instead been on the advanced vehicle technologies like electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, uh, to some extent fuel cell vehicles, how do we develop, you know, I mentioned sort of the hydrogen initiatives that are underway to, to, to power fuel cell vehicles. And again, again, I think you have to look at all of those three categories that I mentioned as part of a, as part of a, a comprehensive transportation plan where you really look at the design uh, and planning of your transportation system ahead, you know, before you even get to the point of building, you know, electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids or trying to develop the, the new cool source of algae biodiesel is to ask, you know, where are you going and why are you going there before you ever get to how am I going to get there or what am I going to get there in. And we haven't been really good about that to date, um, really anywhere. It's not, not, I'm not picking on Oregon here. I think we, we, we haven't really taken a, an integrated approach to transportation planning in this country, really ever. Um, there are probably some examples here and there where you know, municipalities or, or, or uh, regional governments uh, have certain initiatives or pilot programs. Um, one of the, the policies that we had been trying on for size is the idea of a clean car standard. And we, we tr because the, the federal government regulates uh, fuel economy, basically the, fed, you know, the federal government has said states can't come in and set higher fuel economy standards. And that's reasonable because you don't want to have this mishmash of different standards in different states. And you have auto manufacturers that are trying to manufacture you know, California-only cars versus, you, know, you have to have something that, that, that's uniform across the country. What that's left us with, though, is, is the inability to actually get to reducing climate emissions, climate change, changing emissions in the scope, scale, and timeline that we actually need to. And so California stuck its neck out first and said, well, if you're not going to let us regulate fuel economy, we'll regulate what comes out of the tailpipe as an air, you know, as an air quality matter, and we'll regulate and limit the amount of greenhouse gases that can actually come out of the tailpipe. And then the auto manufacturers um, called Holy Haywire and filed suit in the federal courts, in state courts and the federal, the fed, the federal courts to, um, to overturn that. And so far, they've actually been successful. So the idea uh, behind that being that if, you know, if California can band together with a few other key states, um, as, as we've done, you've got, you've got the West Coast states, 12 other states, and then some additional interest from states like Colorado, and I for, 
Florida, and I forget what the other one is, um, that represent over 40% of the new car market, if those states band together and say, hey, this is what we're doing, really the auto industry has to follow suit. They, um, they can't, like, you know, they, again, they can't have differentiated um, fuel economy standards and technologies. They're really going to produce a car that can be uh, rolled out in markets across the country and then, you know, when they export cars around the world. So it's been challenged in the courts by the auto manufacturers on the basis of federal preemption under the Clean Air Act. They basically say, California, you can't step out in front of the federal government. California then applied to the Environmental Protection Agency for a waiver to say, that's great and all, but we actually have these, you know, we actually have these goals. We've adopted a greenhouse gas uh, reduction target a they called the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and we were requesting a waiver from this. Basically, we think your rule is ridiculous, and so we want to go out and, and sort of chart our own course. And the EPA sat on it for a long time. Meanwhile, the auto manufacturers came into California to make administrative claims at the regulatory, you know, sort of on the regulatory side outside of the courts um, to say that you can't do this to us because it's just, it's too expensive. Um, a lot of organizations have, have been you know, come back to show that their claims are actually incorrect. The auto manufacturers are saying it'll, it'll cost, you know, three, I think it was like 3000 to $4,000 per vehicle to add all of these different features to basically improve fuel economy. So that was their, that's their argument in the courts is, look, you're just trying to, you're just trying to go through the back door to regulate fuel economy and to actually reduce the greenhouse gas emissions out of the tailpipe. It's just going to be too expensive. And a lot of other organizations, again, have, have shown that that's not that's not actually the case. There's some fairly simple off-the-shelf solutions that car manufacturers, in my not-so-humble opinion, should, they, they should be doing anyway, but they just choose not to do, to, um, you know, basically to keep their production costs low and their profits high. So there's a follow-on suit by California that 14 other states, including Oregon, uh, that have adopted clean, the clean car standard um, to, to try to overturn these decisions on the basis of undue harm by delaying the waiver. Um, you know, basically saying because the EPA has waited, California and these states have suffered additional damage as the result of climate change. Um, in December of this last year, the EPA indicated their intent to deny the waiver, then, then formally actually denied it. And those states turned around and filed suits, uh, filed suit again, challenging the merits of the EPA decision. And that's still, as far as, I'm, as, far as I know, that's, that's still pending, which was then followed on by a congressional inquiry to show that the EPA um, technical, their legal and technical staff were prepared to grant California's waiver and actually made the case for it with technical data. And Stephen Johnson, uh, in, on behalf of the, the federal administration, ignored the staff recommendations and denied the waiver. So I think I've talked a little, uh, probably enough about the low carbon fuel standard and what it actually does. We're going to, again, we're going to be considering it most likely as part of the global warming legislation that will be coming up in the 2009 session. The, the, the advantage here, you know, not only is it, is it agnostic in terms of the, in terms of the fuels um, that you, you know, in other words, it's not just sort of picking picking which, you know, which fuels we want and which ones we want to phase out, but it really kind of puts the, frankly, it puts the petroleum manufacturers to task to reduce carbon from, uh, from petroleum fuels, whether it's through, you know, improvements in refinery operations, looking for different sources of fuels, blending in biofuels, uh, making advances on, on, on electric vehicles and, and electric vehicle technology. Uh, reducing air pollution, you know, not just global warming emissions, but cleaning up air pollution more generally for other criteria emissions, um, and to also follow a different fuels path than what the petroleum industry is setting right now, um, which includes highly polluting domestic resources like fuel from coal to liquids, tar sands, and oil shale. Um, lest I have a completely boring PowerPoint presentation that is, you know, merely text and talking points, what I really wanted to do was throw in this slide, which is what's happening today in Canada, you know, several areas of Canada, and this is, these are photographs from the Alberta tar sands. What you basically do is you go in and you dig up these, um, you know, it's basically this earth material that's got a lot of petroleum locked in the middle of it. It's nice, not a nice pocket of petroleum that you just kind of, you know, 
you know, either using steam or water or whatever to kind of extract this, this nice liquid that you then refine, you've actually got to use a lot of energy and water to clean this stuff up, to get the earthen material, the, you know, the earthen material out of it, extract the petroleum, and because it's very thick, you actually have to do, you know, a, a, a lot more to it than you would a standard barrel, barrel of like light sweet crude to get the kind of products that we currently use out of it. This, this, this photograph on the bottom left was the most interesting one to me, which I think is basically the effluent from one of these things killing an entire area of forest. Um, I'm from the, the, the Kentucky Hills, that's where I grew up, and what was really the most shocking to me was to drive through there um, as a little kid and see these whole areas where you think a mountain should be, and it's like, why is there a, f a nice, neat, green field there? That's kind of an interesting geological feature, and what it is, it's mountaintop removal, where they basically just shave off the tops of mountains to remove coal. Um, we don't have the best coal mining practices in this country, but there is a, a huge interest in developing domestic coal resources and turning them into liquid liquid fuels for transportation, um, turning them into so-called clean coal, which I actually am over time and don't have time to pick apart exactly what clean coal means. I'm not entirely sure I can in the time that we have. Um, but to, to, to produce electricity, um, so this is an example of kind of, this is the, an example of the direction that we're going as we um, exhaust these, you know, nice, neat, easily accessible pockets of, of um, of lighter, lighter oils. And so there's, there are a couple of challenges in, in implementing this policy I won't, I won't go into, um, none of them insurmountable, but I wanted to talk about maybe some of the, you know, the, the legal issues that would come up around it if you're interested in, in this, or maybe we can talk offline. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, more kind of general transportation policies that were in that third category of looking at infrastructure, roads, Columbia River Crossing, all of these different things that, um, that Oregon is facing right now. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I won't, uh, the, the last thing I do want to mention before I close is the way that we fund transportation and road improvements here in Oregon is, is largely based, one of the, one of the most significant re revenue mechanisms is called the gas tax, and it's basically a, a tax on your petroleum fuels. When you pull up to the pump, a certain portion of what you pay goes back into, uh, into this fuel tax revenue to the state of Oregon, you know, there's federal taxes, state taxes, you know, and then, and then the, the oil companies and distribution and all of that stuff. So it's a, it's a fairly significant amount of revenue for roads here in Oregon, and it's constitutionally tied to public highways, roads, and streets, with fairly limited exceptions. So it's very difficult to go into the gas tax and say, we'll, we'll just increase the gas tax and use that on public transit and multimodal uh, and, and intermodal and solve congestion. and you can't do that. We're actually constitutionally bound. So what we have to do in this coming session is look for ways, uh, additional ways to fund transport, you know, in transportation improvements. And I would say that that has to include uh, multimodal going just, just beyond, just beyond vehicles and, and, and looking at, at vehicles as the answer.